Hi, this is Pastor Jedediah with Jesus Hire and Pastor Jedediah Ministries. And today I want to bring a message to you that I believe is going to touch your heart and it's going to change the way you think and the way you approach living for Jesus Christ and living for God. And so today's message is especially for pastors, especially for preachers, especially for elders, especially for uh, deacons and, and Christians in general who serve the body of Christ. And so I want to bring this message to you today and I hope it will bless you. I know it will. It's called, Is There No King In You? Is There No King In You? And so we're going to be talking about that today and I'm just glad to be here with you. Um, I'm thinking it's going to take about 45 or 50 minutes to cover um, all this material and I'm blessed to bring it to you. So let's open up with a prayer. Uh, join me in prayer please. Heavenly Father, we come right now, Lord, and we thank you for uh, just being the God of our lives. We thank you for giving us the power to speak into existence in your name the things from heaven upon the earth. Father, we thank you for uh, Jesus having spoken to us and said that if we speak to the mountain in the name of Jesus, that it must move, that he's given us that kind of authority that kind of king who lives within us, that kind of king that empowers us to live a victorious life, that kind of king who was the greatest example of a great shepherd. And so, Lord God, we ask that you would uh, bless us right now. We ask that you would uh, be with us as we enter into this study. And uh, we ask that your Holy Spirit would uh, give revelation and understanding to those who are listening. I pray that you would use me uh, by your Holy Spirit as an instrument to uh, bring forth this word and let it all be for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. So here's the question, is there no king in you? Is there no king in you? Is there a king in you? You know, this question was asked uh, a long time ago and it was asked back in the book of Micah in chapter 4 and in verse 9. It says, now why do you cry out aloud? Is there no king in you? Is your counselor perished? For pangs have taken you as a woman in travail. You know, Israel had been taken into captivity. And God's idea there was to, to bring out of that captivity a remnant of people who would acknowledge him as God who would serve him as their only God, who would, who would love him and obey him and trust him and would move and breathe and have their very being in him. And God had reached a point with the people of Israel where it was necessary that they go into captivity, that that generation go into a time of, of hardship and difficulty and captivity so that they could learn to rely upon God. Now what had happened was that this uh, people of Israel had become a fearful people. They had become a people who began to worship false gods. A people who began to live, live in fear. And, and what is fear but a lack of faith? You know, a lot of times we, we think of faith and we think, uh, you know, that's, that's something that, uh, uh, something very strong that we need to have. And reality is, faith is the ability to simply trust God, to put yourself into His hands, and to depend upon Him instead of depending upon yourself. And so what happened with Israel was they had arrived at a place where they began to depend not only upon themselves, but upon false gods, upon demonic influences, upon idols. And, and, and when we look back in the book of Ezekiel, we find that there was a time when the leaders of Israel, the priest, the holy priesthood, and, and the leaders in the temple were in darkened rooms and they were secretly worshiping uh, demons and idols and, and other false gods. And so God sent Ezekiel and he said, if you put your hand uh, in the wall and take out a brick and you reach your hand in there, you'll find a door. And if you open that door, you'll see what is really going on in Israel. And so all of these things are kind of a background to, to this question. And, and the question is, 
is there no king in you? And, and the reason this question came about again was because Israel had reached such a state of disbelief and unbelief and, and falsely placed belief and, and demonic uh, sorts of and, 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 and in gods that are not God. There are no gods. And so God had became extremely disappointed in Israel, extremely heartbroken, extremely upset with Israel. And when you read the book of Ezekiel, you find that, you know, God had agreed to come down and let his presence be in the temple with the Ark of the Covenant and the Holy of Holies. And when all of these things happen back in the book of Ezekiel, God was so heartbroken that he removed his presence from the temple and he sent angels to slay all of these people who had worshipped these false gods and these idols and who were supposed to be representing Israel and representing the one true God Yahweh and he sent these angels to put a, put a mark on everyone who should not be killed and those people were preserved and then all of the people um, who were engaged in this kind of activity or who condoned it or who went along with it. All of those people were slain and God took his Ark of the Covenant and his presence and he departed back into heaven because his spirit was heartbroken at the way that these people were living. And so we fast forward to the book of Micah and we find that Micah received this revelation and Israel is in captivity and Israel is suffering and Israel in that generation is going through a time of captivity and hardship and so God revealed this message to Micah and God said that he's preparing to do a new thing he's preparing to do a new thing and so he asked the people of Israel, Now why do you cry out aloud? Why are you whining and complaining? Is there no king in you? Did I not choose you to be my people, my royal priesthood? Did I not select you? Did I not let my spirit be with you? Did I not give you kings when you requested kings? Did I not give you priests to honor me? and to lead you in worship of me. Is there no king in you? Is your counselor perished? And he says, for pains have taken you as a woman in travail. Now, we, again, God's purpose in this captivity was to deliver for himself a remnant of faithful servants. And so he asked the question, is there no king in you? And it's a very good question today for today's uh, leaders in the church, today's spiritual leaders, whether you be a pastor, a minister, an elder, a deacon, a volunteer, or just a Christian who loved the Lord. Is there no king in you? Is your counselor perished? You know, today we hear about so many things going on, and just the other night, uh, with this whole new thing with uh, Obamacare, um, my wife and I were looking at our policies in the state where we live uh, and we noticed that the there's a, there's a sticker shock, a huge, huge sticker shock to the plan that is available to us, which uh, by the way we live in the state of, of Georgia and I don't have all of that down pack. I don't know if Georgia, I think Georgia is not participating. Um, in that but as a result we were we were given this uh, state plan and it's a single user a single provider plan and within the plan there's a gold a silver and a bronze level and then there's different tiers of um, benefit that you can option for but the reality is that we could only afford perhaps one of the first two plans, either the, the bronze or the silver, but certainly not the gold because the price is just too high. And then the other part of that is that the they put a certain amount of money in your account. I think the, the bronze plan, they put $200 in your account. The 
um, silver plan they put four hundred dollars in your account and then in the gold plan they put five hundred dollars in your account and you, once you use that fund that little bit of fund they're charging you three four five six hundred dollars a month and then you're given this allocation of funds and once you use those funds then you have to start paying out of your pocket and <clears throat> under some of these plans there is no maximum out of pocket and the amount that you have to put before they pay anything beyond that initial uh, two or three hundred dollars is sometimes six seven eight thousand dollars out of pocket and then they begin to pay uh, a percentage which is about 85 percent if, if I got the numbers right but anyway the whole thing revolved around this conversation with my wife that you know in reality we probably feel like we're, we can't afford to even get treatment for um, anything that we would need concerning our health and so we started talking about the options of uh, because we travel overseas of maybe um, getting health care overseas and in uh, different countries where it's more affordable to actually get on a plane fly overseas and get um, the health care that that one needs and so why am I sharing that with you I'm sharing that with you because when I began to put all of that together and we began to look at the plan options and what the real costs were that made it is going to make health care unaffordable um, you begin to come up with all these scenarios about how you can um, how you can deal with that how, how are you going to deal with that for your family how are you going to deal with that for uh, your wife and for yourself and so when I was working through that process the Lord began to speak to me through the Holy Spirit and he began to say is there no king in you is there no king in you is your counselor perished am I not well able to take care of you you're almost 50 years old and you're in perfect health and that's because I have kept you in perfect health because I am your God and because I love you this whole deal with with health care yeah it's a very serious issue but you need to know that there's a king in you you need to know that there's a counselor in you you need to know that God is well able to preserve you and protect you and take care of you and so that that's the kind of thing that Israel was facing you know Israel faced uh, all of these enemies and, and all of these attacks and and at some point they began to, to develop these fears and to try to figure out how to get around this or how to get around that instead of coming to a point of hearing from God and relying upon and trusting in God to be able to deliver them as he had done so many times before they began to worship those false gods they began to, to follow uh, demonic spirits and so God sent them into that captivity but the question is is there no king in you we're going to go on and look at Micah chapter 5 and verse 4 and I'll be reading out of the Holman Christian Standard Bible Micah 5 and verse 4 and this is where a revelation happened because I was studying this with my wife um, a lot of times we read uh, some scriptures and talk about them before we we go to bed at night and so we we're reading Micah chapter 5 and verse 4 and it said he will stand and shepherd them in the strength of Yahweh in the majestic name of Yahweh his God they will live securely for then his greatness will extend to the ends of the earth now this is talking about um, the Messiah who was to come it's talking about Jesus who was going to be born in Bethlehem and God was saying you know you had these earthly shepherds these earthly uh, priesthood and they failed they they took a wrong turn and when they took a wrong turn to follow these demonic spirits and these false gods they took Israel with them they took the people with them instead of leading the sheep in the right direction and in the right way they led them astray and so that's why Israel went into captivity it's one of the reasons so God is saying I'm gonna show you and I'm gonna give you a good shepherd 
someone who I call and see and know and perceive as the Good Shepherd. And he says about this Good Shepherd, He will stand and shepherd them in the strength of Yahweh and in the majestic name of Yahweh his God. And you know when I read that, the Holy Spirit just quickened me. It's a word that, that, that we use, He quickened me. There was, a, there was a revelation that said that there's two different types of pastors. There's two different types of ministers. There's two different types of spiritual leaders. One is one who will stand and he will preach and he will teach but he'll do it in his own strength. He'll do it in his own mind, in his own understanding. And, and then there's another type of pastor, another type of preacher, another type of teacher, another type of spiritual leader who will not only stand, but he will stand and he will also shepherd the people. You know, there, there's um, some pastors um, who, or spiritual leaders who seem to be a pastor to everyone, but actually a pastor to no one at the same time. And, you know, it's, it's, it's just a, a, I think sometimes in our modern culture um, with, with television and internet and so many different ways to be able to speak and bring the word, we find a lot of pastors who are able to stand and speak, but when it comes to actually shepherding the people, some pastors don't want any part of that. They want to they want to stand up and speak. They want to be in the front. Maybe they want to be seen. Maybe they um, they want to be known as someone who gets up and, and is able to be a great orator or a great speaker. But when it comes down to the spiritual hard work of shepherding the flock, a lot of pastors don't want anything to do with that. They really don't. And so when God was painting a picture of, of Jesus who was to come, the Good Shepherd, He said He will not only stand, but He'll also shepherd. He will stand and He will shepherd them. And it won't be by his own strength. He says he will stand and shepherd them in the strength of Yahweh, in the majestic name of Yahweh, his God. And so we find that God had this vision of what a good pastor would look like. And, and it looked like Jesus. It looked exactly like Jesus because it was Jesus. But, but he brings that before us and he says, you know, there's some pastors who are just going to stand and they're just going to speak and they're just going to say things that sound intelligent and they're going to say things that sound creative, but they won't shepherd my people and they won't have my spirit within them. They won't be Holy Spirit led. The revelation won't be there. What they'll be imparting will be um, human knowledge, will be uh, insightful things will be things that uh, quicken the mind but do nothing for the spirit and so God is saying I want my pastors my good shepherds I want them to not only stand and speak not only stand and declare the word of truth not only stand and teach about the goodness of God the grace and the mercy of God but to also shepherd his sheep and he says this, you know, with, the, with these two types of pastors that existed in history and also exist today, he said there's one who will stand and preach without the power of God and has no intention on shepherding the sheep. Those who stand and shepherd the people of God in the strength of Yahweh, in the majestic name of Yahweh, are what God sees as good shepherds good pastors and, and this is the result with the first type of pastor who just stands and speaks but doesn't shepherd the flock the sheep live insecurely and there is no greatness and no authority to advance the kingdom of God to the ends of the earth now with the second type of shepherd who not only speaks and preaches and teaches but also shepherd the flock. It says that the sheep will live securely 
and that the greatness of God will extend into the farthest reaches of the earth. So what kind of pastor was Jesus? Well, when we look at uh, John chapter 10, verses 11 through 16, Jesus talks about himself as the good shepherd. And, and he was the good shepherd that was alluded to back in Micah and so many other places. But in John 10, verses 11 through 16, and I'll be reading out of the Holman Christian Standard Bible, beginning in verse 11, he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired man, since he is not the shepherd and doesn't own the sheep, leaves them and runs away when he sees a wolf coming. The wolf then snatches and scatters them. This happens because he is a hired man and he doesn't care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, Jesus says. I know my own sheep and they know me. As the Father knows me and I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep, but I have other sheep that are not of this fold. He's talking about us. Uh, he was speaking to his, his Israeli um, Jewish disciples and he said, I, he says, but I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. Then there will be one flock and one shepherd. God wants us to be the kind of shepherds who are willing to lay down our lives for the sheep, who know the sheep and, and, and the sheep know us because we're involved in their lives. We're, we're intimately involved in, in their family and their lives and their spiritual lives. And, and we're there and we're connected. We're not disconnected just getting up to speak. We're connected because we're not only speaking and teaching and preaching, but we're also shepherding, guiding, going ahead, helping to, to, to make a way, helping to lead. And you know, there's one thing about uh, the difference between herding sheep and herding cattle is you really don't herd sheep um, when you when you look at how people um, who work with sheep, how they how they work, is that the sheep know their voice, and and they go ahead of the sheep, and the sheep follow them. When they speak, they can speak to a, a particular sheep, and that sheep will recognize his, the the good shepherd's voice. Now, with cattle, you have to herd cattle. You have to get behind them and push them and push them and push them. And a lot of times um, in pastoring or, or, in, or in ministering, we tend, uh, sometimes we tend to want to herd the church. We want to get behind them and, and, and yell and scream and, and lasso and push and brand them and get them to go where we want them to go. Uh, and, 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 and that's done by force and by coercion. And, and God, that's just not the model that God has. The model that God painted was a model of a of a good shepherd, a good spiritual leader, or a good group of shepherds, a good group of spiritual leaders who the sheep willingly and lovingly follow because they're not only preachers and teachers, but they're involved and connected in their lives. So what kind of pastor, minister, leader, shepherd, elder, deacon, Christian is God longing for? What does the heart of God long for? What kind of shepherd was David? You know, we read in the book of Acts in the New Testament that David had a heart that beat to God's own heart. So what kind of heart does God have? Let's take a look at that verse. It's in Acts 13 verses 20 through 22. And I believe this is out of the message version. It says, up to the time of Samuel the prophet, God provided judges to lead them, talking about Israel. But then they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, out of the tribe of Benjamin. After Saul had ruled, ruled for forty years, God removed him from office and put King David in his place with this commendation. Now David received a commendation from God, and this is the commendation. God said, 
I've searched the land and found this David, son of Jesse. He is a man whose heart beats to my heart, a man who will do what I tell him. That's the kind of pastor that God is looking for. That's the kind of minister, the kind of elder, the kind of deacon, the kind of spiritual leader, the kind of Christian that, that God is looking for that brings joy to his heart is a person whose heart beats to God's own heart. A person who is willing to do everything that God asks them to do. And they're willing to entrust themselves to God. Now let's look at 1 Samuel 17 verses 32 through 37. And, it's, and it says this. And it's talking about, um, this is David speaking. And in verse 32 it says, Master, said David, don't give up hope. I'm ready to go and fight this Philistine. Now, if you remember, this is this is Saul, uh, when Saul was king over Israel, and the Philistines came against Israel, and they taunted Israel for days and days, and and challenged Israel to bring forth a man from the Israelites to fight the giant Goliath of the Philistines. And there was no one found and all of the Israeli soldiers and all of the Israeli warriors who would go forth and do battle with this Philistine giant Goliath. And so David, who had been taking care of his father's sheep, came to deliver uh, bread and some other things to his brothers, bread and cheese and some other things. And he heard this giant who was taunting Israel day after day after day unceasingly and was making fun of and taunting and poking at, at Israel and Israel had no one among them who had the heart of God to respond and so David is speaking here again in verse uh, 1 Samuel 17 starting in verse 32 and he's talking to Saul and he says Master said David don't give up hope I'm ready to go and fight this Philistine. Saul answered David, You can't go and fight this Philistine. You're too young. And you're too inexperienced. And he has been, been at this fighting business since you were born. In other words, Goliath has been fighting and he's been a soldier longer than you've even been alive. You're just a kid. You're just a teenager. You're, you're a nobody. You're a wannabe. You're not qualified. You're not even a soldier. You haven't had the first day of basic training. You haven't went through um, any of the drills, any of the preparation, any of the advanced skills that our soldiers have. You have none of that. You're just a talker. You're just someone who's going to stand there and talk. And so this is what David answered to King Saul. David said, I've been a shepherd. I have been a shepherd. He didn't say, I'm going to grow up one day and I'm going to be a shepherd, or I wish I was a shepherd. David's response was, I've been a shepherd, and I've been a good shepherd. Tending the sheep of my father. Whenever a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I'd go after it, knock it down, and rescue the lamb. If it turned on me, I'd grab it by the throat, wring its neck, and kill it. Lion or bear, it made no difference. I killed it. And I'll do the same thing to this Philistine pig who is taunting the troops of God alive. God who delivered me from the teeth of the lion and the claws of the bear will deliver me from this Philistine. Now Saul was hearing that. And what Saul was hearing, Saul recognized was not just some young kid up speaking to be speaking, someone who wanted to be seen and heard and known and perceived as, as a great orator. No. The ears of Saul pricked up and Saul said, go and God help you. Go and God help you. Because Saul recognized in his inner being that, that what David was saying was anointed. And it was anointed by God to be said. And he said, I've been a shepherd, tending the sheep of my father. Whenever a lion or bear came and took a sheep from the flock, I'd go after it. 
knock it down and rescue the lamb. And if it turned on me, I'd grab it by the throat, wring its neck, and kill it. Lion or bear, it made no difference. I killed it. And I'll do the same to this Philistine pig who is taunting the troops of God. God, who delivered me from the teeth of the lion and the claws of the bear, will deliver me from this Philistine. So again, David didn't say, you know, I'm young now, I'm just a kid, but one day I want to grow up and be a shepherd. David said, I have been a shepherd. I've been there, I've done that. You may see me as young, but God is with me, and he called me, and he appointed me. I've been out there day and night taking care of my father's sheep. I've been worshiping, I've been praising, I've been vigilant. When I've seen the lion, I've seen the bear, I didn't wait. I went after them. I tracked them down and I killed them. If they turned on me, I wrung their necks and I killed them. But David was very clear to say that it was God who he had depended upon and it was God who had delivered him. But David said, I'd go after it. I'd knock it down and I would rescue the lamb. Do you have the pastoral heart of David caring for the sheep? Would you go after the enemy? Would you knock him down to rescue God's sheep? You know, David lived the life of a shepherd caring for the sheep. Many, many long days, lonely days, and even longer nights, and more dangerous nights, sleep depraved, in song, in prayer, staying awake, ever vigilant, ever ready. The heart of God's pastor. I just spoke to you about the heart of God's pastor. How and why? Because David knew that he knew that he knew that God was with him and that he was operating with the help of God and with the Spirit of God and the protection and the power of God. David was a man with a shepherd's heart and God loved him. God ate it up. It made God's heart rejoice to see that David had the same kind of heart that God had. David's heart beat with God's heart because God's like that. God will come and defend you. God will come and protect you. God will rescue you. God will go after your enemies. God will chase them down. God will overcome them and God will take them out because God had the heart of a shepherd. God is the good shepherd. Jesus is the good shepherd. Now I want you to take note of a couple of things that David didn't just wait around dreading the lion or the bear attack. David would scout the land. He would look for signs of an intruder. He would sniff the air. And then if he detected the lion or the bear, he would be empowered by God and through God and his faith in God to chase after the lion or the bear and to slay it and to rescue the sheep. David had the heart of a warrior to go on the offensive, to not dread the attack, but to go after the attacker before he struck in order to protect his father's sheep. You know, the majority of lion attacks happen at dark, at nighttime, where there could be an element of surprise, a time when the shepherd is tired, sleepy, a time when visibility is lacking, a time when the predator thinks that he can move within the shadows of the darkness and that he can sneak up and shift around in the dark shadows in order to strike by surprise. But you know what happens? David smells him. David hears him. David has already tracked out the path that the animal is taking. He knows already before it gets dark from what direction the animal is going to come from. He senses it. 
he hears him and David goes on the offensive to attack the attacker. He goes after the attacker before he can even attack the sheep. You know, most attacks that happen in a church happen when there's a lack of vision, when there's a lack of village vigilance, when there's a true lack of, of vigilance, when there's a lack of dependence upon God, when there's a lack of trust in God, when there's a lack of depending upon God and a lack of pastoral leaders who have the heart of God, the heart of David, the heart that beats to God's own heart. When the enemy comes and he finds a group of sheep, a group of, of Christians, a group of believers who are not properly shepherded, their shepherd is, is one who just stands and speaks but doesn't shepherd the people, then that lion or that bear, that demonic spirit or that that spiritual attack comes more easily upon such a group of people. And so let's consider the lion and the bear attacks. There's some things I want to talk about. You know, a single lion can kill several sheep in one night. People a lot of times have the impression that a lion will come and kill one sheep and that's it, he'll leave. That's not what actually happens. Most of the time, lions kill multiple sheep in one single night. There's one well-known account of a single lion having killed 192 sheep in a single night. Again and again and again, unhindered, he would go in and would kill the unprotected sheep. Now on average a lion will kill five to ten sheep and carry them away to a hiding place to feed on them in the days ahead. So the average is five to ten sheep but there's, there's this well-known case where 192 sheep were killed in one night. Now also a lion will generally eat the legs and the head and the neck of the sheep or, or the animal and only later will it eat the stomach and the internal organs. I know that sounds gross but it's, it's important so hang on with me. Now a lion also kills its victim normally by suffocating them, by crushing their windpipe or by breaking their neck. Lions also work together to pursue, to harass, to entrap, and to slay their victims. Now, wh what I want you to take note of is that the, the method of attack of a lion is different than the method of attack of, an, of a bear. In the case of a bear, a bear normally attacks with brute force by knocking down the animal with their huge paws, clawing them, and then crushing them to death or biting them on the, on the back of their neck and, and severing the juggler uh, vein. And so bears normally attack out in the open and then they drag their prey to a hiding place to feed upon them. Also bears normally consume the internal organs and the stomach area before eating any of the other parts of the animal. And so what we find is that there's two different kinds of spiritual attacks that are, are very frequent and very common against the sheep. One comes through the lion who works together with other lions to, to make a surprise attack upon the sheep. And what that lion feeds upon are the legs and the head of the sheep. And what that really is a picture to us of is that, that it cripples the, sh the sheep where they, they can't move, they can't get away. And he feeds on the head and on the, on the legs, where the bear starts on the inside and feeds on the internal organ and, and the stomach area of the sheep. And so I just want you to know, just like there's two different kinds of, of pastors, one who gets up just to speak and one who speaks speaks and preaches, but also shepherds. There's two different types of attacks, but well, there's actually a multiplicity of types of spiritual attacks. But in this, in this case with the lion and the bear, there, there's two different ways they attack and there are two different ways that they go about consuming their enemy, which would be us because we're the sheep. Okay, so what I want to point out to you is that David had to be valiant 
David had to be well informed. David had to be a well trained and formed hunter. He had to have the spirit of a, of a hunter. And David had to be a trained reader of signs and tracks and one who recognized tracks and knew about animal customs and habits. I can imagine uh, David's father taking him out and training him to be a shepherd and pointing out to him the tracks of the, of the lion and the tracks of the bear and the tracks of this animal and the droppings uh, of the lion and the droppings of the bear and what does a, a lion smell like and what does a, a bear smell like when you, when you catch a smell of them on the wind. All of these things are a part of, of David who was a good shepherd. Now surely when David saw lion tracks or bear tracks his adrenaline must have rushed forth. He must have uh, his nostrils probably flared and, and, and it was God inside of him, the Spirit of God inside of him pushing him forward to go after the beast, after the attacker, to track it down, to attack it and to slay it, setting free any sheep that may have been caught. Or, or I can imagine many times David probably did this before the enemy had a chance to even attack. When David would see signs of a bear or signs of a lion, his nostrils would flare up and he would go out and he would track and he would follow and he would attack and he would subdue and he would overcome and he would kill that lion or that bear before they ever had a chance to attack the sheep. And so David didn't have a high powered rifle like we might have today and you know as a matter of fact a bear or a lion is fairly easy to kill with a high powered rifle on a long distance and and David didn't have uh, radio communications where he could call in back up and say hey you know I went after this lion and I really thought I could handle it and things got out of control and so you know he's on the radio or, or on the cell phone dialing 911 that I really need some backup I need some help didn't happen didn't happen you know today um, our soldiers who fight overseas are very accustomed seemingly to to be able to pick up a radio and call in uh, airborne help uh, to pick up a radio and and give them some coordinates and have them drop some bombs on on an opposing attacking force or they're able to call in a Black Hawk helicopter with machine guns and say you know so and so uh, degrees latitude and longitude let them have it and you see the videos of the Black Hawks rushing in and, and uh, laying down a pattern of fire and so they had that kind of backup David didn't have that kind of backup the only backup that David had was God with him God within him God's Spirit working through him to deliver him and so David had to trust in God. He had to rely upon God. He had to be led by God. He had to be propelled forward by God's Spirit. And so the question for you is, who do you trust? Who is your air support? Who do you call out to when you need help? Who do you trust, Pastor? Who do you trust, Minister? Who do you trust, leader, elder or deacon, servant, volunteer, Christian? Who do you trust? Who do you call when things go bad? You know, there's that saying, uh, Ghostbusters, right? Who do you call? Who do you call? Call Ghostbusters. Um, who do you call? David was a shepherd and he walked out his commission to guide, to protect, to serve, to rescue to care for his father's sheep. Do you do that? Is that how you serve God? Does your heart beat to the heart of God? You know, there's many, many pastors or ministers who want to get in a pulpit and preach. They want to be seen, they want to be heard, but when the attack comes, they don't want any part of having to shepherd the sheep. And they often disappear 
and they, they vanish, leaving the sheep to the lions and the bears. You know, it's one thing to be a pastor who may become a politician, and it's completely another thing to become a politician, who, to be a politician who wants to become a pastor. And, and why do I say that? You know, I think a lot of uh, Christian leaders have a huge influence, and they can have a political influence within the law where it's allowed. They can have a political influence for good, a political influence for, for God. But when when a pastor becomes a politician, that's one thing. But when a politician becomes a pastor, it, it's very confusing because, because one um, speaks for himself and one speaks for, for God in, in, in a broad sense. And so, Jesus says that the kind, that kind of pastor is paid, is, is a salaried person. And there's nothing wrong with getting a salary, receiving a salary. Everyone has to, to live and provide for their family. But that kind of pastor is bought off. It's working for money, working for fame, working for fortune, and perhaps working in his own strength. You know, uh, when the Bible asks the question, now why do you cry out aloud? Is there no king in you? Is your counselor perish? For pangs have taken you as a woman in travail. It was because Israel had begun to cry out to God and say, you know, God, here we are. We're, we're nothing. We're worthless. We're enslaved. We're, we're entrapped. We're, we're locked up. We're um, subdued. And, and we don't want anything to happen to us. And it was because Israel and her leaders had became had taken on a cowardly spirit and they had become fear filled and driven by fear their constant prayer was that nothing bad would happen to them that no attack would come against them that they would be spared it, it's what we call a prisoner mindset that had enveloped them and God's answer to them was this now why do you cry out loud why, why are you whining and crying out is there no king in you? Is there no king in you? Is your counselor perish? For pangs have taken you as a woman in travail. It's like so many leaders and Christians today who continually cry out to Jesus, asking him to do this and that. And they say, you know, Jesus, just don't let anything bad happen to me. Don't let anything bad come against me. Don't let any storm, don't let any raindrop fall upon me. You know, but it's something very interesting that Jesus told his own disciples. And it was about this very thing. In Matthew 17, verses 19 through 20, and I'm reading out of the message version, uh, Jesus, it says, when the, disciples had, when the disciples had Jesus off to themselves, they asked, why couldn't we throw it out? Talking about the demon that, that they couldn't cast out. That, that Jesus was able to cast out. So they, they took him off, they took Jesus off by, by themselves and they said, why couldn't we throw him out? Why didn't we have the power to throw him out? Why, why were we not able to do that? And Jesus said, because you're not taking God seriously, said Jesus. The simple truth is that if you had a mere kernel of faith, a poppy seed, say, you would tell this mountain, move, and it would move. There is nothing you wouldn't be able to tackle. Jesus is saying, if you trusted me, if you had faith in me, if you took my promises seriously, then you, I want you to note how many times he says the word you. He says, if you had faith in me and you trusted me, that I'm going to work with you and through you and, I, and my spirit's going to push through you and we're going to push back. He says, if you, you had a mere kernel of faith, a poppy seed, say, you would say to this mountain, move, and it would move. There is nothing you wouldn't be able to tackle. So what's Jesus saying? He's saying, why are you whining to me? 
why are you constantly coming to me and saying don't let this thing happen or that thing happen or I don't want to go through this or I don't want to go through that he said you know what I've given you the authority because I am in you Father Son and Holy Spirit living in you I give you the authority to speak forth in my name and if you don't want that mountain where it's at in my name tell it to move and it has to move now mountains you know in this text it represents authorities and and kingdoms and things that come against you and so god is saying if, if if you don't like what's going on in your life speak in the authority of god by the scriptures of god through the holy spirit and watch how i work through that to change things you know god spoke and and said let there be light and there was light god spoke everything into into Everything in creation, He spoke it into existence. And so you're able, through faith, to speak words of faith in Jesus' name. And you're able to move things, see things move spiritually and, and, and physically. You're able to see things move in Jesus' name. But it's you who have to speak. It's you who have to make the proclamation in faith. And so Jesus is saying, trust me. Take me seriously. Take my promises seriously. And you, when you speak, and you speak in my name, there's nothing you won't be able to tackle. There's nothing you won't be able to handle. So he's telling us, you know, be, be a person that's not motivated by money. Don't be interested just in, in everything to do with yourself. Jesus is saying, I want you to be valiant. I want you to be strong in faith. I want you to believe in me and to trust in me. I want you to rely upon me with all of your being. I am in you and working through you. And it's I who am able to deliver you. With Jesus in you, you can do all things well. You're not just a survivor, but more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus your Lord. You know, I know time is running out here, but, you know, there, there are a lot of people right now that are in survival mode. There are people who have stored up water and ammunition and uh, these underground bunkers, and they're called, uh, you know, end-time survivors. And so what, what the Lord, I think, wants us to know is that we're not just survivors. We're overcomers. He created us to overcome just like He overcame. He overcame death and the grave. Jesus was valiant and Jesus was strong in God's power and he was full of the anointing and faith and, and full of good works and he was all about protecting his father's sheep. And Jesus laid down his heart. And you know the heart of Jesus is found when he said, Here I am Father, not to do my will, but to do your will. That's the heart of Jesus. He said, you know, whatever my father wants done, I'm here to do it. I'm all about him and doing his good will and protecting his sheep and caring for his sheep. Are you the kind of pastor or minister who can say with a clean and pure heart and hands, here my father, not to do my will, but to do your will. You know, so many people spend their prayer life praying uh, for this or for that and, and for this not to happen and that not to happen but again I found in David David who had the heart after God's own heart I never find that David prayed oh God don't let the lion come oh God don't let the bear come I mean what am I gonna do and and you can imagine uh, a lion roaring in the distance and the, the, the sheep all get nervous and and can you imagine David oh, what am I gonna do oh my goodness did you hear that lion roar did you did you smell that bear you never find that in the Bible you find David who had a heart after God's own heart when he heard the lion roar he said in his self his nostrils flared up and he said I'm coming after you. I'm coming after you. I've already been tracking you. I know where you go. I know where you sleep. 
I know how you operate, I know what you eat, I know what your droppings look like, I know what you smell like, and I'm coming after you. And that's going to be the end of you. I am going to be the end of you because God is in me. You can roar all you want, and if you jump on me, I'm going to grab you by the neck, and I'm going to choke you, and, and I'm going to overtake you, and I'm going to rescue God's sheep. That's the heart of a warrior that, that David had. Instead of praying for bad things not to happen, David decided from his childhood to walk in the power of God to overcome everything that came against him, whether it was lions or bears or giants or people or enemies. David decided, hey, you know what? There's a king in me. And surely enough, God saw that king in David and he anointed him in his childhood to become the next king of Israel. And so David recognized and lived like there was a king in him. A good shepherd, a good pastor, a good minister, a good servant laid down his life for God's sheep. A good servant, a good pastor, a good minister, a good servant that's not guided by his own self-interest not by fame or fortune, but is guided by pleasing God and protecting God's sheep. A good shepherd, a good pastor, a good minister, a good servant, a good Christian will both stand and shepherd. He won't just be one of those that just stands and speaks pretty things. He'll be one who stands and speaks in the power of God and he shepherds the sheep of God in the strength of Yahweh in the majestic name of Yahweh and Yeshua HaMashiach which is Jesus the Messiah and so I just want to share with you that it takes both standing and shepherding in the strength of Yahweh and in the majestic name of Yahweh your God to be a good shepherd and so today we've looked at what it takes to be a good shepherd and we've looked at the heart of God and the heart of David and we've looked at, at how we need to be valiant and strong and, and trusting so let us not be named among them who preach by their own strength by their own intellect alone but rather let us be found willing to do everything that God asks of us and to do it His way and His timing by His power and for His glory in Jesus' name. Let us not wait for the lion or the bear to attack, but rather let us say, I'm going after the enemy. I know how he operates. I know where he sleeps. I know where he hides. I know what he eats. I know what his droppings look like. I know what he smells like. I don't have to wait for him to come. I'm going after him because I am a good shepherd, vigilant, full of valor, full of the power of the Holy Spirit. And I'm gonna go after the enemy, pursue him, attack him, and slay him in Jesus' name. So that's the message today. You know, there is a king in you. There is a king in you. And it's time you recognize that, that God has put you through some things so that the king could come out. You've gone through some troubles and some hardships and some difficulties so that the king can come out. And so, let me encourage you today. Get alone with God. Spend some time with God in prayer and, and fasting and in the word and in prayer and, and get an understanding with God that you, your heart, that you want your heart to beat with his heart. That you want his power to be your power. You want His strength to be your strength. You want His deliverance to be your deliverance. And it's then that you can stand in the power of the Holy Spirit when you're filled with the Holy Spirit and, and preach the Word forth and the strength of God with revelation and understanding that will touch hearts and will change lives. So let me pray for you as we close and we're at the one hour mark. So I'll be quick. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God, for this day. We thank you for blessing us. We thank you for uh, letting the words just roll out, Father. And we just thank you for the heart of David.
who was a servant after your own heart. Father, we ask that you would help us to be like David, to be like-minded, to have the same kind of heart, the willingness to do your will and not our own will, the willingness to go after the enemy even before he comes after us. We pray, Lord.